taking the time to join us and watch um, the occurrences of what we have going on. Due to the continued efforts by the state to contain COVID-19, we will continue meeting in this manner until um, it's possible for us to gather again. So um, just be patient with us and, and, and we'll, we'll eventually get there. So I want to quickly take a roll call of our RAC members and then just quickly kind of introduce, I'll be introducing the presenters in a moment, um, but just some other individuals from the division that has, have joined us tonight. So just a quick um, roll call. And so make sure that you unmute your mic when I call your name. So Steve Duke. I'm here. Thank you. Scoot Flannery. Here. Thanks. Jay Skyman. He's here. I didn't see him. Thank you. Kent Johnson. I see him. I see him. He's here. Eric Luke. I'm here. Thank you. Darren Olson. I'm here. Great. Kurt Claire. I'm here. Great. Brad Richmond. I can see you, Brad. Um, Todd Thorne. Here. Dana Truman. I'm here. Thank you. Lynn Sitterud. I think I see him wearing this. Yeah. And then I am here. And so um, from the division, we have our, our biologist, Brad Crompton, Guy Wallace. We have Lieutenant Roger Kerstetter that will answer any questions um, pertaining to the divisions, anyways, um, anything pertaining to law enforcement. And then we have Chris Wood, the Southeastern Regional Supervisor. So just keep that in mind as we move along. If you guys have questions that outlie the presenters, that there are individuals here to answer those questions. So the first thing that we wanna start with is the approval of agenda and minutes. So do I have a motion on that? I'll make a motion, Tricia, this is Kent. Approve agenda and minutes. Great. I have a motion by Kent Johnson for the approval of the agenda and minutes. Do I have a second on that? This is Dana. I can second that. Great. And I have a second by Dana. All in favor. So I'm going to just quickly do a roll call on that. And then I'll talk about the procedures as we move along. So real quick, Steve. Yes. Scoot. Yes. Kent? Yes. Eric? Yes. Darren? Yes. Kirk? Yes. Brad? So, can you give me a thumbs up or down? Thumbs up, good, positive. Todd? Yes. Thank you. Dana? Yes. And that looks like that is that passed unanimously. So thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and move to the wildlife meeting um, board update. And that's via me. So I'm going to kind of just concentrate on the things that were somewhat um, points of contention as we went through Bucks, Bulls, and Once in a Lifetime. Everything else Passed. We passed it unanimously, but let's just look at a couple things. Um, there was a move to decrease the buck deer permits on the cash unit by an additional 800 permits for a total decrease of 1,600. And that was our recommendation. And it was actually the recommendation, not, I think, of every other rack in that passed. I had a recommendation, and this was our recommendation, to increase the Henry Mountain Archery only bison permits by one permit. And that passed. Um, there was a motion. So this is, a, a, there was a motion by Kevin Albrecht to, we moved to decrease the permits on the San Juan Abajo buck deer hunt by an additional 150 permits, bringing the total decrease to 650. So just so you know, we asked for 850. Um, and so they kind of cut the difference a little bit. So it was, it was a compromise. I think it was 500. So they went up to 650, just so you 
have a feeling of how that went. Um, I had a move to decrease buck deer permits on the LaSalle Mountains by an additional 100 permits, bringing the total to 1,300 from 1,200. So we asked for, let me make this right. We asked for permits from 1,300 to 1,000. So again, there was a slight kind of compromise on that. There was no moves whatsoever by the Wildlife Board on Nine Mile and Manti. And that was a couple motions that we made. So just keep that in mind. The other thing that was um, pertinent to us and we had some contention about was the antler list tags on the book cliffs, Bitter Creek South and the roadless unit. And we, they took our recommendation. We, moved, we asked to reduce the antler list tags to a total of 150 tags with no more than 15 being in the road list. That recommendation was taken by the Wildlife Board. Um, right now, the recommendation from the Northeastern um, region was, I believe it's 20 in Little Creek. So that kind of came after the fact and, and I don't know. So anyways, there's not a, a, we didn't go much beyond what we asked for in Little Creek. So it's 20 in Little Creek and then 80 in the early season and then 50 in a later season on those cow tags. Um, so, or the antlerless tags. So, and, and again, everything else was fairly benign and, and we moved along. So do you guys have any questions for me on that? It was quite nice. I will state that meeting went very quickly. I think we were done by, I don't I wanna say by lunch, which is odd. And we didn't have Trish, to Yeah. This is Eric. Hey, yeah. did you say there was uh, on the Manti, we, we proposed a 500 tag decrease. Was there no decrease whatsoever? No, not anything on the recommendations. Yep. No motion on okay, that. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yep, you're welcome. Okay. So yeah, it was it was it actually moved really quickly and and fairly nicely and so it was, you know, somewhat of a nice change. Um so let's now go to Chris, are you there? I am here. Okay, let's go to do you want to do both your regional update and then talk about chair? Yes, okay, that's great. exactly right. So okay. good evening. Um, I'm gonna do two things right now. I'm gonna give you a regional update and then we need to talk about our rack chair position. Um, and I emailed you about that last week to hopefully you have a heads up and been thinking about it. So um, first the update, uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, we, we are um, getting busy. Our seasonals are on board in our various programs and we're obeying the governor's health orders, but continuing to work on and doing great things. Uh, the last few weeks, our biologists have been working with our federal partners, the BLM and the Forest Service, both our habitat guys and our wildlife guys, and getting out on the range and doing utilization transects. We do this every spring. We kind of gives us an idea of how the deer and elk have been using the range, the winter range, and we measure pellet group counts and we measure shrubs and, and grouse shrub utilization throughout the winter. Um, our biologists are kind of gearing up for this upcoming summer and early fall to do uh, deer unit plans. And we're trying to figure out how um, to do that during this COVID-19 restriction. So um, there'll be some committees formed and uh, we'll be working through that process so that these unit plans are written this summer and, and ready to go for the fall uh, for the public process. Um, our aquatic section did some gill netting last week. They went to Schofield. Uh, it looked really good, the finding from that gill net. Um, they had three or four different age classes of, of, of tiger muskies, and they are indicating that the growth is good and the survival is good. The rainbows that we've stocked the last few uh, years are performing really well, and we've also received a lot of compliments from the public regarding those rainbow trout. Um, and then the cutthroat in the nets were cutthroats of all sizes, and some of them were pushing past the upper end of the slot. So, um, of course, that reservoir historically had a lot of chubs, and that's why we've changed management on that reservoir. The chub populations are really low, um, and the chubs that we do net are about 10 inches long, 
and uh, we don't get a lot of younger chubs. That's an indication that these predator fish are controlling the chub populations. And as these tiger mutts get even bigger, um, they'll be eating those bigger chubs as well. And so really the management plan that we passed through the rack and the board process, I don't know, three or four years ago, it's working. The chub numbers are down, these predator fish are growing and they're keeping those chubs in check. And so um, the, the, the fishermen that I talked to have nothing but great things to say about the direction of Schofield Reservoir. Um, we'll be doing some other gill netting this, this week. We'll go to be going to Cleveland and Mammoth Reservoirs if the ice is off at Mammoth. Um, we're also doing some pitfall traps on East Mountain this week. And then uh, Giotti Pond here in, in Helper um, got some renovation done this, this the last few weeks. We lowered the water level, took out some cattails, and now we're um, bringing water back in. Um, our officers have been really busy too. This is, um, and last week, you probably saw in the news, there was a search and rescue and recovery effort at Goblin Valley. Um, two young children were lost in a flash flood event. Our officers responded to that, uh, both the search and rescue portion and the recovery portion of that call. And uh, I think we had six officers on the scene uh, for those two days. And so our officers work so hard. They're, um, they're highly trained and they're ready to drop everything and be public servants and, and help people out at any time. And uh, last week was a, a perfect example of that. Um, and even though the outcome was very sad, it was it was nice to give the family a resolution and help with that effort. Uh, Lake Powell is open. Uh, Bullfrog is open. We have seasonals living down there and working down there and, and trying to educate and uh, help people understand the aquatic invasive, the quagga muscle issues, and try to contain that to Lake Powell. And then our, uh, the last few weeks, our biologists have been doing some sage grouse counts. Numbers are up a little bit on the greater sage grouse. I should say that last year was a 30 year low. So um, hopefully we're gonna continue to rebound from that. Uh, the Gunnison sage grouse in San Juan County, those numbers were really low. We only uh, counted two males and one female. Um, other things going on throughout the region. We had a, a, a cougar in Castle Dale that you might've heard about on Sunday night. I think we had a bear and a, a bear cub running through Moab on Monday. And so, you know, spring is here, animals are out and, and we're busy responding to different calls and trying to serve the public. Um, so before I move on to the chair position, is there any questions about my regional update? All right. Um, we have our chairperson is Trish. Uh, she has served for three years. Uh, our RAC rules state that a, a chairperson should should serve for two years and they could be reelected to another two year term. I apologize, I did not do this last year. I should have put up this, uh, put it up for vote last year after Trish has served two years and allowed uh, either a reelection of Trish for two more years or a new chairperson for two, for two years. So I, I forgot that and so here we are today. Um, and so I'm opening it up to the rack and uh, you can either um, re-elect Trish for one more year, or if you'd like a change, you can re-elect a new chairperson and that person will serve for two years. And then we'll revisit this issue in two years. So with that idea, I'm open to hearing from you guys and, and someone making a motion and having some discussion. Um, and I don't get easily offended. So I don't think you're gonna hurt me. I, I should say that the chairman position, you're committing to go to board meetings. Um, it's an, basically an all day Thursday thing. The division does reimburse your mileage and your meals that you're gone for and your hotel expense if you need to stay the night before. But it is a, an all day Thursday type thing, you know, six or seven times a year. Um, this is Dan. Anna, is Trish willing to serve another year? Trish, are you willing to serve another year? Yeah, I'm I'm good with that. Well, this is Kent. I'd just soon make a motion and get it on the floor. Let's keep Trish for another year. I think she's done a good job. Okay, and I should say too, we also need an assistant chairperson, and uh, Kent Johnson is currently serving as that. Um, so let me go take that motion. Kent had a motion to um, elect Trish for an additional year. 
Is there a second on that motion? This is Todd. I'll second it. Todd is seconds it. Okay. So now I got to do what you do, Trish. This is going to be difficult. Okay. Um, let's have a vote on that or any comment on that motion at all. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if we should make also a, a comment on the motion to make an, a, a chair, an assistant chair, so I can do this one time instead of two times. Um, but I'll make a motion uh, that we can't, that uh, Kent stays in as the uh, assistant. Okay. And, and Kent, are you okay with that motion then, or that amendment to the motion? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so we have a motion for Ch Trish to be our, our chairperson for another year and to Kent, an amendment to that motion to add Kent as the assistant chair, or keep Kent as, as the assistant chair for another year as well. And so um, we had that, mo who was the second? I forgot, Todd was the second. I'll go through uh, the list and we'll vote on that now then. Um, let's see, Brad Richmond, yay or nay? Yay, okay, he gave me a thumbs up. Okay, Darren Olson. Yes, I approve. Okay, Dana Truman. Yes. Eric Luke. Yes. Okay, Kirk Player. Yes. Kent Johnson. Yes. Stephen Duke. Yes. Scoot Flannery. Yes. Todd Thorne. Yes. And Trisha Dean. Do I vote? Trisha. Yes. I, I, I guess, I don't know, maybe, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, it's been passed. Um, Trish will serve as our chairperson for another year and we'll address a new chairperson. It'll have to be a new chairperson next year in 2021 by rule um, a year from now. So thank you for that. And I think that's all I got. So back to you, Trish. Thanks so much. Okay, so we're going to move right on. So our first action agenda item is Upland Game and Turkey Guidebook and Rule Recommendations by Heather Tolley. Am I saying your last name correct, Heather? It's Tolley, but very close. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. So hopefully you have all had a chance to watch the pre presentation. At this time, I'm going to have Chris Wood give us the um, public comments on that. Thank you. So we had three people respond to our online survey um, regarding, well, I guess they're regarding all the agenda items tonight. Um, according to our, and hopefully you, re, you uh, read all the comments that were received as well, the three people that they made comments. I will not try to um, paraphrase their comments. You received those already. But 33% um, of the people supported the proposal. 66% of the people were uh, opposed the proposal and 0% were neutral. So there you go. Okay, thanks so much. So at this time, do we have questions from the rack for Heather? I've got a quick question. This is Steve. Um, my question was, I was hoping she could clarify, uh, one of the things she talked about there is uh, crowding, kind of the statistic on crowding. Um, as a measure of, of permits. And I just need a little explanation of how you gather that data. I was just, could you help me understand that a little better? Sure, thank you. We just sent out a survey and it's part of our harvest survey is for people to rate from one to five their crowding level and their satisfaction level. So we just get that from the survey that we send to the public. Perfect, thank you. That's exactly what I needed to know. Other questions for Heather? Uh, uh, so this is Dana. I have a question on exactly what, I guess, is the division's proposal. And if this is the right time to ask, I had a question on the Turkey Management Plan due for revision and the three-year extension. Is this the correct time? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I just, uh, I see like in the, pres or I heard in the presentation and I see that it's recommended to extend our current plan three more years. And I guess, um, could you elaborate a little bit on the data or 
what has happened and, and why the three-year extension, um, I guess, is a good thing. Sure. So we have our parameters set up, such as the crowding trigger, the satisfaction, the percent success. And with those triggers, we want to keep those at certain levels that we have, we're predetermined in the plan. And because we're not hitting any of those triggers, we just wanted to keep this plan for three more years. And then we would do a revision at that time. Um, but with those um, ratings and everything, if any of those triggers were to be hit, we would address that issue within this plan cycle as it calls for, the, for addressing those in this current plan. Okay, so the current plan does allow for addressing any issues that come up in the next three years. Definitely, okay. yes. Great, thanks. Are there other questions for Heather? This is Kirk. Um, can you go into the reasoning behind the air guns. I think this is the time. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is a great time for that. Thank you. For the air guns, we wanted to offer another opportunity, another weapon type, just for the fall season only for turkeys, and then as well as for rabbits and hares. So right now, where turkeys are able to be harvested in the fall season with a rim fire, and that's also legal for rabbits and hares, we wanted to allow air guns for those same species that can currently be taken with rifles. So that just helps to expand the opportunity for people to hunt and give them another metric to take those turkeys with since our fall hunts are designed to reduce populations to address those human turkey conflicts so that we can um, provide a lot of tolerance for those people that are dealing with a lot of those conflicts and be able to grow them in other places of the state. So then a follow-up question to that um, it is, I'm sure there's some concern as far as lethality of it. And then also does law enforcement have any concern on being able to um, enforce the PSI? Like, how, I mean, I don't, I can't even wrap my head around how they could enforce the PSI unless they had some tool that they brought in the field to test. That's a good question. I have this explicitly in the rack packet, but it was not part of the presentation. So just to clear that up for anybody that wasn't able to see the rack packet for any of the members of the public, I just want to read really quickly some of the stipulations that we have for our minimum requirements. So we have this listed as a pre-charged pneumatic air rifle, meaning an air rifle that fires a single projectile with compressed air released from the chamber built into the rifle and pressurized at 2,000 to 3,000 PSI from an external high compression device or source, such as a hand pump compressor or scuba tank. Um, this, <clears throat> also this pre-charged pneumatic air rifle would could be firing a single broadhead tipped bolt or arrow or pellet or slug during the fall turkey season that is 22 caliber or larger, weighs 18 grains or more, and is at least is fired at a velocity to produce at least 30 foot pounds of energy at the muzzle. So, with the additions that you would need to have externally um, onto your air gun, we feel that that we would be able to tell somewhat easily whether the somebody's just using a hand pump BB gun from Walmart or whether they actually went and got all those higher end things that would make it more lethal. I have a question regarding that. Um, some of the, some of the pump style air guns may have the ability by pumping, you know, more more pumps to get that psi, but they could also be pumped less times and and not get that. Um, is, is that a concern? That's why it has to have that. Um, external high compression device. That's why that's part of that language there. And we did draft this with our law enforcement section, so they'd be comfortable with it as well. But yeah, it has to have those um, extra external pieces as well. So 
So are there any more questions for Heather? Because if not, we can move on to comments or clarifications. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move I, on to- okay. I have one, Trish, uh, yeah, and, and maybe ahead. I should have asked it as a question. That's okay. Uh, it's kind of That's okay. Iraq, I guess, uh, more so than, uh, but I know that there was a proposal uh, sent out by SFW considering uh, changing the way the youth are, uh, you know, possibly getting a little more time. I've seen comments both in favor and against this uh, with some, some good, uh, good valid points on both sides. Um, I, I personally think that you know, the, our youth are our, our future of hunting. And I realize they, they do have quite a bit of opportunity now. Um, I, I guess I'm curious uh, with the other RAC members um, what their thoughts are and, and if this is something worth bringing up and making a motion. Um, so my, my question is more to the RAC. It's hey. I thought about quite a bit too, Eric. Um, I'm not, I don't know which side I come down on. Like you said, there's valid points on both sides. Um, I, you know, to be fair with, um, I've noticed with the divisions data and it's been brought up, a lot of the, the youth opportunity is way underutilized as it is. So, you know, the question I guess then would be, are we, are we actually accomplishing anything if we go with SFW's recommendation? As, you know, that's my one question of it because a lot of the, the youth stuff that's geared towards just the youth with Upland game specifically, the hunts are really what underutilized. But I and I, if somebody made the motion to go with that, I I might would support it anyway. And then, I mean, I guess while I'm on here, well, go ahead. I got another comment though, Tricia. In just a minute. I, this is Darren. Maybe I'll comment. I I'm an avid turkey hunter. I I probably hunt turkey once about a week every year, whether it's limited entry or general. I personally would hate to see that general season get pushed back any later uh, than it already is. Usually that's uh, early May. So to push that back another week, I think would be uh, doing a disjustice, I guess, to a lot of those general tag owners or, or holders, I should say. So uh, I'm not really a supporter or fan of that proposal. Um, not anything against the youth. Uh, just, just more for that general season. So, Darren, uh, I, it was my understanding that it wasn't going to affect the general season. It was, it was actually affecting uh, the later limited entry portion. Um, I might have to read that again, but that's the way I remember it. it the, the general season wouldn't have been affected, but the, it was cutting into the general or the limited entry. Yeah, and, and maybe I misunderstood that. I got the impression it would push the general season back a week, but um, yeah, that's a good question. Heather, can you clarify that? So this has probably, I'm not entirely sure where this landed because it's kind of gone back and forth a couple of times. So, um, but just to address either side of the issue that might, give a good overall synopsis is of course there's that issue with if general season hunters are displaced any later that could really impact their harvest success and with the limited entry side of it um, we wouldn't want to move that date any earlier because we want to keep with that second saturday in april as far as the start date to allow for 60 to 70 percent of the breeding to occur so that we make sure to allow for that to happen and to decrease the 
opportunity of possible incidental take of hens. But also um, with that, it's just to, for everyone to kind of keep in mind that the limited entry season this year was three weekends long, the way that it fell on the calendar. But last year it was only two weekends long. So if you cut a week off the end of the limited entry, there is that possibility in some years that that might cut the season almost in half for those limited entry hunters and um, or, you know, on the other end to to displace the general season hunters. So just for review, we do have 15 percent of permits allocated to youth for the limited entry season, and then they would be able to hunt through the end of May if they didn't harvest. And they do just have that one three-day season, um, but then they can also, if they do buy a general season or a youth tag for that time frame, they can also hunt through the end of May on that tag if they don't harvest. Trish, I pulled up that proposal. Uh, so what they're what they're asking is for um, the the limited entry hunt to go from the second Saturday uh, in April to the last Sunday in April. And it's the, that last Sunday is the change. Um, and then the youth hunt would last from, from the last Monday in April to the following Sunday. So I guess it affects a little bit, basically only a, a day or two of the, uh, general season, but it does affect both a little bit. So just, just wanted to clarify what that proposal was. Right. Okay. Thank you, Eric. So we've, we've had some discussion. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I have a comment on the air rifles. Yeah. Great. I was curious about that myself. So I, I'd done a whole bunch of research and talking to folks and looking up different rules from other states. And then I went so far as to look at, you know, there was question about lethality and there was one comment that we received from the public that was concerned about that. So I was concerned too. I've never hunted with an air rifle since I'd done things you're not supposed to do with one when I was 10. So um, I looked it up and as far as being lethal, the ones that are set up to be legal under state rules are probably within the range. You're going to be hunting turkeys anyway, say out to 50 or 60 yards. They are way more lethal than a 22 long rifle is. They, it's, I mean, if you look it up and read it and some of the penetration and wound channel stuff into ballistics medium, it's it's actually quite impressive it's pretty incredible what they can do with the especially if you get to the 25 and 30 caliber ones they're they're quite lethal and and probably a very effective hunting tool so i would i would have no problem at all with going ahead and allowing that based upon my research that was my comment on that tricia Thank you. This is Kirk. I've got one more kind of comment with bundled in with a question. Um, one is, and I, I don't think it was addressed in the packet, but is that, is the Pittman Robinson, is that, do they pay the excise tax on the air rifles? And then two, um, if Heather could just briefly touch on, I'm sure you've seen it, what Pheasant, Pheasant, Pheasants Forever sent on the Idaho model. Um, because that's one thing that I've, you know, from the beginning, don't get me wrong. I love to go shoot those birds, but it's like, it, it's just so short lived. We know the birds are going to die and it seems like, well, is this a hundred thousand dollars that maybe we should be putting in the habitat or something else that that might be a happy medium where we're not throwing a bunch of money away that could be used on habitat, but then also going out and, and shooting those birds. Cause it is a great time. Sure, I can touch on some of that stuff. So the Pheasants Forever um, proposal was, for those of you who may not have seen it, it was essentially for a few WMAs to be only allowed access 
with certain punch cards that would be purchased by certain prices for residents versus non-residents. And that would give them three days and six birds that they'd be able to harvest either or. So um, with that, we received that proposal after our rack packet had already gone out for the year. So we weren't able to really look into all the different avenues and the ways to do that. And in order to order extra birds, we would need to already have the budget for that ahead of time and then let the growers know um, by the end of the previous year so they'd have time to grow their birds and everything. So we did have an extensive conversation with the Pheasants Forever chapter presidents and discussed this at length this week or last week rather, and they were really, um, we really liked their enthusiasm and the types of ideas that they had, but it's gonna take us a little bit more time to work towards that. So we're willing to look into that to explore what Idaho's doing, but we just have to give it a little bit more time so that we can try to get some logistics in place to see if that's feasible. And remind me of your other questions, sorry. Uh, the air rifles and the excise tax, Pittman Robertson. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. The PR tax. So right now where, um, the air guns have been legalized for shooting bolts with big game, they have until the end of December to pay that PR tax. So we're hoping that they're going to go through and get that approved. I spoke with one of the owners of, of some of those places with the air guns in Utah earlier this year. And they said that they don't have it approved yet, but they are still working on it. So our hope is that that will go through. Okay, so at this time, I and mean, we've talked about a number of things, but it seems like everybody's, it's kind of wavering. So I don't know if we have some extraneous motions that we wanna make before just taking the division's recommendations. And if not, I will take a motion. I would make a motion to approve the division's recommendations for upland game and turkeys. Okay, so I have a motion by Kent Johnson to approve the upland game and turkey guidebook recommendations as presented. Do I have a second on that? I'll second that, Darren. I Okay, I have a second by Darren. And so I'm gonna just quickly do a roll call with um, the votes. Steve, yay or nay? Yay. Scoop. Yay. Kent. Yes. Eric. Yes. Darren. Yes. Thank you. Brad, up or down? I can see you. Okay, we've got a thumbs up. Thank you. Todd. Yes. Thank you. Dana. Yes. And it looks like it passed unanimously. Did I get everybody? Oh, wait a minute. I, did, I didn't vote, but I'll say yes. Kirk. I was going to say, I missed. Oh, sorry about that, Kirk. I missed somebody. Sorry about that. Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. So that passed unanimously. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate it. All right, so next we're gonna move on to uh, migratory upland game recommendations and swan rule amendments by Blair Stringham. And Blair, you're here, correct? Yep, I'm here. Can I answer and any I questions for you? Pronounce your last name also. Yep, just Stringham. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you wanna say. All right, um, so Chris, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you with public comment. Yeah. Um, we had one person support the proposal and two people were neutral on the proposal. Okay. And you received those comments as well from that, from those three people. Okay. All right, so at this time, do we have some questions from the rack for Blair? Uh, yes, this is Dana. Um, Blair, you had mentioned that up in East Box Elder, the Sandhill Crane season would be extended nine from nine days to 60 days. Um, I think likely due to, I guess, impacts to private landowners. But can you just give me, elaborate a little bit more on why that large extension in season? Yeah, so we've been watching that population for some time now. Um, what we've seen occurring um, through GPS callers is that a lot of cranes are coming into that area in September, and they're staying through about November before they begin migrating. And so 
the purpose of that season is not necessarily to put more permits out there or harvest more cranes. It's just to allow hunters to be more flexible and when they go hunting, um, as well as to work with landowners to go later into the season and try to just keep those birds moving from problem fields or just to begin their migration and keep moving south. Okay, thanks. I have a question, Tricia. It's Kent. Um, Blair, has there been any talk with regard to extending into different areas of the state with a permit here and there for Sand Hill Crane? I mean, specifically into the southeast region, like in the last few years, I've noticed cranes are moving in here and wintering. They're starting in some of them we're seeing in October, but generally November, December, January, they're all over the place down here now. Yeah, we have talked about that quite a bit. Um, one of the, the challenges we have with sandhill cranes is we only get a limited number of birds that we can harvest in the state each year. And so at this point, we've tried to focus those permits in areas where we're having really like outstanding depredation concerns and crop damage. And so it hasn't really transitioned into more of an opportunity hunt, which it would be in other parts of the state. Uh, but if we ever did get to the point where we did have some excess permits and we felt like we were on top of damage in other parts of the state, we would definitely start exploring southeastern part of the state, the center part of the state, some of those other areas where we have cranes now, but we aren't hunting them. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Blair? Um, well, this is Dana. I guess I'm not very familiar with tagging swans, so could you elaborate on the differences? Sure. Yep. So some of our bird species, um, we had to go back and re-look at our rule because they specifically say that we have to tag the bird um, where it was retrieved at. And so uh, specifically with swans, a lot of times hunters will hunt those over water um, and the swan will fall out in the middle of the water. And so it's not really logistically possible for them to tag the swan at that specific location. So we try to redefine that so people can actually retrieve the bird and go back to their boat or go back to dry land and tag the bird um, so they can be compliant with the rule as well as have something that is actually feasible for them to do. Okay, that makes a lot more sense, thank you. So if we don't have any more questions, let's move on to comments and or clarifications and or motions. Or awkward silence. I'll make a motion to uh, accept everything that they said for okay, that so one. A motion by Kirk Player to on migratory upland game. Um, do I have a second on that? I'll second it. I have a second by Kent Johnson, and I'm going to go ahead and take a um, take a vote right now. So, Steve. Yay. Yay. Good. Scoot. Yay. Kent. Yes. Eric. Yes. Thank you. Darren. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Thank you, Brad. I can see it. Thank you. Todd. Yes. Dana. Yes. Thank you. And it looks, and I think I've got everybody that time, correct? I think so. Good. And that passed unanimously. All right, so now we're going to move on to Aquatic Invasive Species Rule Amendments by Bruce Johnson. Um, Chris, let's start with you with public comment. Yep, we had one person support the proposal, two people were neutral, and zero opposed. Okay, great. And at this time, if you guys have questions for Bruce, let's go ahead and throw them out there. Trish, this is Steve. A quick question. I was just curious. This really doesn't have to do with passing anything, but I live in Monticello and I see a lot of folks come from Colorado headed to Lake Powell. And I think there's a few of them that, that stop at recapture. I'm just wondering if they've had any documented issues at recapture reservoir with quagga mussels. No, we haven't to this point. It doesn't seem to get a lot of use. We do spot checks 
contacting those boaters that you're talking about, but we haven't seen any any issues that would make us concerned enough to up our efforts at that location. Okay, thanks. I was just I was just curious. Awesome. Any other questions for Bruce? So we can move on to comments, clarifications, and or motions if we are ready. Uh, just uh, one comment based on the question is, um, might be a good idea to, to step up efforts and be ahead of the clogger muscles getting into another body of water rather than wait until they're there and saying, oh no, oh crap. Maybe, it's, maybe we get out in front of it a little bit. And with that, I have a comment. It looks like with some of the new rule changes and stuff, the division is trying to get out in front of that. And I appreciate that. And I just applaud the division's efforts there. I apologize. I had a hard time hearing most of that. Sorry about that. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay. It was just, I was just commenting that maybe stepping up efforts around recapture specifically because it is a place that's close to the Colorado state line and, you know, and get out in front of it at that reservoir rather than play catch up later when we finally have any, you know, muscles and stuff in there. And then I also want to applaud the division's efforts in the new rules and stuff to actually get out in front of, you know, Quagga mussels coming in from other states and stuff and being transplant, transplanted from Lake Powell to other places. Just applauding that effort that's being put forth. Thank you very much. I appreciate hearing that and I will forward your comments onto our staff. They're a very dedicated and committed group of people that want to help our resource. And I can definitely talk with our regional AIS folks and discuss increasing some of our uh, checks and efforts there at recapture to see if there's more of a of a threat that we haven't seen to this point thank you so any more comments and if not i would entertain a motion Well, I guess this is Dana. I just wanted to make a comment from like a management agency perspective. Um, I I like the $20 fee. Um, I guess that non-residents will be paying prior to boating because it is important to fund this invasive species monitoring and uh, helping with education. But I hope in the future we will look at increasing fees or at least funding this program um, very well because these mussels and other aquatic invasives are important to control. So keep going with the good effort. Thank you very much. This is Eric, I'll make a motion. We accept the division's proposal as stated. Great, so I have a motion by Eric Luke, Luke to accept the AIS rule amendments as presented. Do I have a second on that motion? This is and I have a second by Kirk Player. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a vote. Steve, yay or nay? Yes. Thank you, Scoot. Yay. Kent. Yes. Eric. Yes. Darren. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Brad. He's frozen, now he's frozen too. Oh yeah, <laughs> gave me a, <laughs> Todd. Yes. And Dana? Yes. Okay, it looks like that passed unanimously. Thanks so much. Okay, and then last on our agenda is walk-in access rule amendments by Brian Christensen. Um, Chris, let's go ahead and start with you with comments. Yeah, maybe I'll just say, Kent, um, we have a hard time hearing you, so in, we just have one agenda item left. So if you have any more comments, make sure you speak right into the microphone. Um, for walk-in access um, rule amendments, we have one person supporting and two are neutral and zero opposed. 
Great. And so we have Brian here. So do we have any questions for Brian on the onset? I have a question. Can you hear Great. me better now? Kind of, maybe, sort of. Yeah, I can. Okay, good. Um, just a question. Has there been any discussion or talk about maybe putting together an app for that, for the walk-in access program? And the, the app for the predator control of coyotes has been pretty successful. So I was just wondering if that's something that is being looked at. Okay. Um, t yes and no. Um, tell me what you'd like to see. And, uh, come up and I can specific if we've moved that direction or if we still need to consider different. Brian, I think you might have cut out. Did anybody, did everyone hear? So I might re repeat that answer, please. Your, your audio is not working yeah. very well. Okay. I have a second. Second chat here. Okay, how's that? Nothing? Or we're good? Much better. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad I keep two sets of uh, earbuds here close by. Um, so uh, the, the, the question, if we have staff geared for can access and, and its attributes, um, is there anything particular that, that you're hoping to see in that app other than just maybe the map system and what you can do there? Oh, just, you know, yeah, the map system, what you can do and, and a way to sign up and just use an app to do it. And it's a, I think that would be a better tool for the division to be able to track who's using it and where they're at and when at, at the same time, as well as making it more user friendly for the, the public that wants to use the program. OK, I, I appreciate that comment because we we haven't really moved forward with a lot of technology and the walk in access program. Um, in in past years, and we've we've really relied on those those wood uh, paper registration box things, and uh, you know as part of this recommendation, we just we're finding that those older methods just aren't working. We're not getting the data we need, and so we want to explore. We want to move into um, some some options like that that would give us better data. Would give us who's using the properties, how often, um, and and if properties are being used at all, you know, those kinds of things. So the answer is no, we don't have it now, um, but that is kind of the intention is to be able to, to craft this rule away from some of the archaic ways of doing uh, registrations and, and monitoring properties and move into more of a uh, opportunities to, to explore that type of technology. Yeah. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Do we have other questions for Brian? Look like it. So at this time, then I'll take any either comments, clarifications that are needed and or motions. I'll go ahead and make a motion to accept the division's proposal on walk-in access. Okay, so I have a motion by Kent Johnson to accept the division's proposal for walk-in access rule amendments as presented. Do I have a second on that? I have a second by Dana. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. Uh -huh. I'm going to go ahead and take a vote. Um, Steve, yay or nay? Yay. Thank you. Scoot? Yay. Kent? Yay. Eric? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Kirk? Yes. Thank you, Brad. Good. Todd? Yes. And Dana? Yes. Thank you. It looks like that passed unanimously. Um, Mike, are you still there? I don't know if he's still there. Yes, I am. Hey, Mike, did we beat the rest of the racks? 
Are we number one at this point? I, I think so. I would have to. Uh, Stacy would give the official uh, thumbs up on that, but uh, I, I'm thinking so. Okay. I was pretty proud. You guys did a good job and you asked good questions. So, Chris, anything else before we adjourn? I don't think so. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, we'll be in touch throughout the summer. Maybe we can get you out on some projects and meet you in the summer somewhere out in the field. Okay. Thanks of course, so virtually distancing, of course, but yes. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, and we will talk soon. Have a good evening. Thanks.